All right, guys, so we need to have a conversation and we need to go over the facts of what is happening in Maui, in Lahaina specifically. And we need to clear up a couple things that people seem to be very confused on. I want to make it so that you guys have the best understanding possible of what has happened, what is happening, what could happen. All right. First off, we're going to start off with the fact that Hawaii officials have released a list of 388 people missing from Maui fires. Let me just be very specific here. When I say they have released a list of 388 people missing from the fires, it does not mean that there are not still a thousand people missing. It means that of those thousand or 1100, which they updated yesterday, that 388 of them have full names. So according to this, the list names people still, the list names people still unaccounted for after wildfires devastated the town of Lahaina and other areas. Officials asked anyone on the list who survived the fires to come forward. Now, authorities in Hawaii released a list late on Thursday, yesterday, naming 388 people who are still unaccounted for in the aftermath of the deadliest wildfires in America in more than a century, which killed at least 115 people. We know that there are more than that. They are saying at least 115 people because I believe that is the only, that is the solid amount of bodies they have been able to find and maybe put names to. Uh, we, I fully believe that they have found way more than 115, but they're not going to update that anytime soon, in my opinion. The fires devastated the coastal town of Lahaina on the island of Maui, as well as other areas of the island more than two weeks ago, August 7th and 8th to be specific. August 7th was upcountry in Kola, Co Kula, K-U-L-A, I believe, and the eighth was Lahaina. Search and rescue teams are still sifting through the last patches of ash and rubble looking for human remains. It's so weird because rubble is normally the word that is associated with an explosion, not with a fire. I've never heard anybody use the word rubble with fires, but that's just me. Maybe I've overlooked that, but I've always heard the word rubble used with explosions. So anyway... Uh, in publicizing the names, the authorities hope to narrow the tally of the missing. In a statement, Maui's police chief, John Pelletier, a.k.a. also the coroner, a.k.a. the one person who is above ev every law possible in Hawaii because he has the ability to overrule the um, forensic pathologist when it comes to the cause of death for people. As the coroner, he has the ability to arrest the police, of chi uh, the chief of police or whatever else, but as the chief of police he is already safe from all of that we covered this yesterday in the video if you guys want to hear more about that make sure when you're done with this one you watch the one from yesterday it will cover everything you need to know it says here in a statement maui's police chief um John Pelletier asked anyone who survived the fire to come forward and remove their name from the list. Officials said earlier on Tuesday that 1,000 to 1,100 people remain unaccounted for. It still weirds me that they don't have a specific number in, in that sense. The list released on Thursday, Mr. Pelletier said, includes anyone for whom officials have a first and last name and contact information for the person who reported them missing. Officials have been bracing the public for the likelihood that the number of confirmed dead from the fires, which stands at 115 as of today, will rise substantially, which I agree with. We also know that once those names come out, it can and will cause pain for folks whose loved ones are lost, Mr. Pelletier said. This is not an easy thing to do, but we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to make this investigation as complete and thorough as possible. Now, it does say here the decision to release the names of the missing came after FBI officials, along with Maui police, the Red Cross, and other agencies, examined various lists compiled by shelters, cross-referencing and combining them into one tally. Along the way, they identified many survivors and removed their names. We do know there was at least 60 people in one home. They have found others, people that they pulled from the water things like that, so they have found numerous survivors. The final toll from the fire, which began in the grassy hillsides above Lahaina and fueled by high winds, raced through the center Sorry, race to the center of town to the Pacific Ocean will probably not be known for months. We're going to talk about that in just a second also, just so you know. Many people died near Front Street in Lahaina, which runs along the seawall in their cars or in the ocean. Many were trapped in traffic trying to escape the fire with the surrounding roads blocked by downed power lines and police officers. Let's not let's not um, over overlook that. Skip that part. You know, certain ways that articles are written, they're going to phrase it how they want to get the narrative that they want. They're not going to give you all the details. They're going to forget to tell you that the police stopped the people from going uh, down. Oh, what is the road? Y'all, this is the part that sucks for my brain when I can't remember the road. I can remember the conversation. I can't remember the road name. But 
traffic was able to flow north and the police had it blocked going south, turning right, so you could not go that way. Whereas if they had left that open, people could have gone both directions and gotten in and out. The way that the people wanted to go, that the police had blocked off, there was no fire down there at that point in time. So stopping them from going that way, all it did was uh, basically cause a massive pile up and a bottleneck, if you will, because you have people converging from all these side streets into this one direction they're allowed to go, and then you can't go any farther, and that's how people died in their cars. So far, the authorities have released the names of 35 people who are confirmed dead and have been identified through DNA testing. Four-fifths of them, 28 people, were older than 60. On Thursday, the first child, a seven-year-old, was added to the list of confirmed deaths. Now, we talked yesterday, and I told you how many people they had confirmed dead, and they said no children, no minors as of yet, which we also knew was not 100% true because there were articles that came out on Tuesday, I believe, of the story of the boy and his family that died in the car. I talked about him on Tuesday, seven-year-old boy. But the reason they did not list him is because his uh, identity had not been confirmed at that point, just that there was a seven-year-old person. So... That is where that update comes, comes from. Now, it says here, countless families have endured an agonizing wait for news of loved ones who are unaccounted for. In the absence of official word, many have held out hope, traversing Maui, clutching missing posters, placing them in post offices, hotels, parks, and shelters. Many relatives of the missing have been reluctant to submit DNA samples for comparison with human remains recovered from the rubble of Lahaina. On Tuesday, the authorities said they had received only 104 samples from family members. We talked about this yesterday. And they renewed urgent pleas for people to submit DNA. DNA, promising that the information will not be used for anything other than identifying the dead of Lahaina and will not be entered into any other government database. How bad is it when we as a people mistrust our government so much that we don't want to give them DNA to possibly identify a family member? That says a lot in my eyes, in my mind, uh, about how we feel as a whole about our government. It says even more about how the people of Hawaii feel about their government. Think about that. The people of Hawaii must feel a certain kind of way about their own government to not want to give them their DNA, right? Now, we do know, we've talked about this numerous times, Lahaina was the majority uh, Hawaiian natives, native islanders, and 86% of Lahaina was residential. So there's going to be a lot of missing people there. And for people not to want to give their DNA, I can understand. Now, people are also saying, well, if the bodies, they're saying they're finding um, basically crisp, crumpled, collapsing bodies, ash, if you will, how do you pull DNA from ash? And I did a lot of research and there is the ability in some cases, not all, they're going to, I'm saying, I, I bet they're going to say that's why they want your DNA is to try it that way. Plus also they have, it's really hot out here. I'm sorry. Um, they have the ability for teeth and bones and things like that in some cases, maybe not all of them. So they're going to tell you that's why they want the DNA. I would say I would leave that up to each individual person to decide how they want to go about that, if they want to give their DNA or not. I personally would never do that Ancestry 23 or whatever it's called. I don't trust the whole send your blood in, send your DNA in, because you never know what they're going to do with it. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. So there's that. Now, we're going to move past this because what I want to mention to you guys is a couple of different things. First thing I want to mention is there's been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth about the school schools in Lahaina and what happened to the kids. And I have told you that some schools were open, some were not. Some had not started, some had. And so some of the kids that had gone into school were then sent home, which is why they're saying that there were children at home alone because their parents were at work and there's going to be a high level of um, adolescent deaths, if you will, even though I'm not 100% sure they're going to find bodies of adolescents because I feel like there may be a different agenda there, but that's not... But what I want to point out to you is I went through and I pulled up every single thing and I want you to see these. This is for, let me see which one this is because I have so many of them here. So this is for Sacred Heart School, Kekula Kamali. I can't do this. Early Learning Center. Their first day was August 1st. So I'm, I try to tell you guys, I try to make sure I have receipts for everything I'm trying to tell you. Their first day was August 1st. First, so they would have been one of the schools that was sent home on August 8th, okay, when the, when the fire was in Lahaina. Now, another one you have here, King Kamehameha Third Elementary School. They did not start until August 9th. If I can scroll here, I zoomed in too hard. So they did not start until August 9th. So they were a school that had, the kids were not there. They were already at home or somewhere else. You've got two other schools here. We've got... Uh, where's the other one? 
You've got here, this, just so you know, is the Hawaii State Department. This is their actual calendar. There, it says here, teacher work begins August 1st, student instructional year begins August 7th. That is for, I don't remember exactly which school that one is, because when I pulled it up, it gave me all of Hawaii State, but that's a different one. And then you have this one here that says that it started on August 7th, teacher, student's first day. And I can't remember which school this is because it gave me the calendar, but without the school name. But I just wanted to point out, there's also daycares. There's also um, like private schools. There are also uh, pre-K places like that that were in and then sent kids home. So yes, there is going to be a difference between kids there, kids at home. I just wanted to bring that to your attention so everybody fully understood that there was more going on. Now, here's what's interesting, and I'm sweating like crazy. It is so hot out here today, um, but my child is home sick from school, and I didn't want to record inside with her. So let me see if I can get this to work. So this is from Daily Mail. Hawaiian Electric is accused of removing evidence that its power lines may have started Maui Blaze in violation of national guidelines. Remember yesterday when we were talking in the video and I was going over the rundown of like the time frame of how things happened and yesterday or the day before, all the days run together for me, um, it was either yesterday or the day before. And I mentioned that in the middle of the entire, you know, town of Lahaina trying to evacuate because of wildfires that Hawaiian Electric, for some reason, had one of their trucks in there messing with a power pole, a power line. Why? In the middle of everybody trying to leave, in the middle of a blazing fire, why is a truck going in and messing with a power line? Well, maybe they were trying to take away something that would have been evidence for something that their company caused. You know what I'm saying? So according to this, Hawaiian Electric, which is facing at least nine lawsuits linked to the fires, allegedly removed evidence from a scene close to where the blaze broke out. The company took equipment, including power lines, from a substation before investigators could comb the scene it is claimed lawsuits against the company say it failed to switch off power before the fires broke out despite weather conditions which meant lines could spark a blaze it says here the electric company accused of negligence that caused wildfires which killed at least 115 people in maui allegedly removed key evidence from a scene close to where the blaze initially broke out Hawaiian Electric, whose power lines allegedly sparked the fires which tore across Maui two weeks ago, removed equipment from a substation before investigators could search for clues about how the fire started. The allegations surfaced on Thursday after at least nine lawsuits were filed against the company. Those suits brought by residents on the island and Maui County itself say the company failed to switch off power despite weather conditions which meant lines could be damaged and spark a fire. Investigators from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, ATF, which investigates fires and arson-related crimes, arrived in Maui last week to help with the probe into how the deadly infernos began. But by the time they arrived, utility crews had cleared equipment, including damaged power lines, from a key scene of the fires and moved it to a warehouse, according to a Washington Post report. There, the scene, a power substation in Lahaina, a power substation on Lahaina Luna Road is close to where the fires are believed to have started. So this is some of them working on power poles on the 16th after the fire started. But again, they were there doing something on the date of the fire on August 8th itself. Now, it says here, oh, there's the, the fires are thought to have started shortly after 6.30 a.m. We watched the video of this one. I showed you the video of this in the, like one of the earlier days where the fire of uh, power line went down right next to the water in this little strip of grass right next to the water. That's the initial fire that they were thinking happened that was put out by a gentleman who picked up his garden hose, basically. Um, it says details emerged after the FBI released a list of nearly 400 names of people still missing after the fires, 388. The removal of the equipment could be a breach of national guidelines on how utilities should preserve evidence after wildfires, it is claimed. Hawaii Electric said it is in regular communication with ATF and local authorities and is cooperating to provide them as well as attorneys representing people affected by the wildfires with inventories and access to the removed equipment which we have carefully photographed, documented and stored. Now, you're not supposed to mess with a crime scene. Everybody knows you're not supposed to mess with a crime scene. You're not supposed to mess with anything where lives have been lost and the first thing they did the company that is being blamed for the start of it, the first thing they did was go in and mess with it. 
Okay. It says here, um, Michael Wara, director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program at Stanford University, told The Post, if a lot of equipment is already moved or gone by the time investigators show up, that's problematic because you want to observe where the equipment was relative to the ignition site. Uh, Waro said, once you remove these things, it's much harder to understand what happened. ATF investigators are working to determine the origin and cause of the wildfires. The Maui probe is only the agency's third wildfire investigation. Such inquiries usually fall within the remit of the Forest Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but that agency is not involved because the fires weren't on national forest lands. Lawyers representing families in Lahaina initially asked Hawaiian Electric on August 10th to preserve evidence, according to the Post. Now, a response from the company the following day said it was taking reasonable steps to preserve its own property. It's interesting phrasing. But it added that the number of search and rescue teams on the ground made it possible, even likely, that the actions of those third parties, whose actions Hawaiian Electric does not control, may result in the loss of property or other items that relate to the cause of the fire. Their response added, Hawaiian Electric will take reasonable steps to preserve evidence, but cannot make any guarantees due to the rapidly evolving situation on the ground, which is also not within our control. On August 18th, a judge signed an order that outlined how the company should treat evidence around the suspected area of origin. Maui County filed a lawsuit against Hawaiian Electric on Thursday. Yesterday, Maui County itself has filed against Hawaiian Electric. The lawsuit was filed in the Second Circuit Court in Hawaii and names Maui Electric Company Limited, Hawaiian Electric Company Inc., Hawaii Electric Light Company Inc., and Hawaiian Electric Industries Inc. as defendants. It alleges the companies acted negligently when they did not power down their equipment following the red flag warning issued by the National Weather Services on August 7th. The Maui wildfires, which erupted on August 8th, have killed at least 115 people, but the death toll is expected to climb. Now, here is a just a little reminder of the massive fire that was going on there. Now, what's interesting to me, and all of it is um, really shitty, not interesting, but what's interesting to me is at the same time that this is happening, you have people with drones being told they can no longer fly over certain areas of Lahaina. You have the Hawaii real estate. I think his name is Eric West. Eric West. He and his son um, have been posting some stuff up. I've seen a lot of their community posts where they're trying to help the people. They've been bringing safe Starlink, the, the internet connection capability that a lot of like van van lifers and you know people who travel a lot of them use those when they're like out in the wilderness and there is no 5g tower they use i believe it's called starlink um this this hawaiian real estate guy and his son and i think wife also have been trying to help people get you know people started with uh gofundmes trying to show you pictures of what lahaina was like before and during the fire and after the fire so people can see what's happening and um he had a drone footage video showing what everything looked like but there's also this article here that says drone flying above suspected origin of lahaina fires grounded operator immediately confronted by government agents and my question is was it government agents or was it hawaiian electric officials who were like no no you can't be here and you can't do that because it says the licensed drone operator reportedly filming the suspected um, origin of the wildfires that ravaged the island of Maui and Hawaii, claimed his drone was grounded and government agents paid him a visit. Now, Fox News host Will Kane recounted the story of drone pilot Davin Phelps in a thread on X, formerly Twitter, um, on August 24th. The aerial photographer said he was prohibited from filming the suspected area where the fires began in the town of Lahaina. Phelps showed Kane a video of the town devastated by fire, with the clips showing buildings largely reduced to ashes. Aside from the video, the drone operator showed several still images that Kane described as stunning and haunting. The Fox and Friends Weekend host then recounted Phelps' story. I don't want to feed ridiculous conspiracies, but all I can do is tell you the truth. The drone pilot says he was hired by an attorney to fly his drone over the suspected area where the fire started. There is a no-fly zone over Lahaina. But as you can see from the footage, that hasn't stopped him from getting images of the town, but it was a different experience at the fire's origin. According to Kame, licensed drone pilots fly through an app coordinated with the Federal Aviation Administration. While the app can deny flight permissions and remotely ground drones, such instances are very rare. He, however, noted that when Phelps got to the suspected fire origin area, he was denied flight and he was grounded. My husband and I, we have a drone. We know that when you want to take off, you have to get cleared for takeoff. 
Now, the, there are higher drones, bigger drones, where you have to have a certain permit in order to use them. We don't have that kind. We have like a little $300 one you can get from Best Buy. We fly it all around here in Florida so we can get um, footage of the beach and Crab Island and the condos and everything else. And we take it on vacation in Canada and, and things like that. But we can't fly it in certain areas if it's close to a uh, power company, if it's close to a airport. And there's other places where you can't. You can't fly them in any national parks, which is why we have no drone footage in Grand Teton or in Yellowstone or anywhere else like that. Um, but it's also one of those things where when we're flying, if we get too close to something, it can be grounded by outside forces without our uh, doing it ourselves. So I do believe when this man says that he was grounded, that is an actual thing that can happen. For, the, for that to have happened, for him to have been grounded at the area where they said the suspected origin is, at the same time, Hawaii Electric is now being basically sued for removing pieces from the area they consider the origin. I wonder if this guy happened to be flying at the same time they happened to be trying to remove some stuff. And that would be very, very interesting if he was able to get anything on camera with that. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I think that's kind of a big deal. Now, I wanted to mention this to you, and this is not really anything to do with the whole, the Maui fires with Lahaina. I just thought it was very, very interesting. I've been looking up Lahaina, Hawaii, Maui, DEW, EMPs, all kinds of fun stuff. And I came across this article. This is from September of 2003. Okay, this is 20 years ago. And it just says electromagnetic pulse EMP. This is from doh.wa.gov. Okay, so Washington, basically. And it says, what is EMP and how is it created? And I want to read this to you because it's very interesting and I think these are things we should know. The most important mechanism for electronic magnetic pulse EMP production from a nuclear detonation is the ionization of air molecules by gamma rays generated from the explosion. These gamma rays ionize the air molecules by interacting with the air molecules to produce positive ions and recoil electrons called Compton electrons. This pulse of energy, which produces powerful electromagnetic field, particularly within the vicinity of the weapon burst, is called an electromagnetic pulse. EMP can also be produced from non-nuclear sources, sources such as electromagnetic bombs or E-bombs. You know, the kinds of things that leave rubble behind. High altitude nuclear detonations and electromagnetic bombs can generate EMP that has the potential to damage or destroy electronic devices over widespread areas. You know, places where they have no cell phone service, they can't get internet service, um, things like that. Okay. Uh, it says here, electric power systems would also be at risk from surges produced by such weapons. However, the EMP from a kiloton range surface nuclear explosion would not be expected to produce serious damage outside the radius of severe destruction from the blast. Now, this is where it gets interesting. And I feel like my camera is getting really dark. And if it is, I'm really sorry. I don't know what to do with the lighting here. This is where it gets interesting. And I need you to understand. Okay, a 1.4 megaton bomb launched about 250 miles above Kansas would destroy most of the electronics that were not protected in the entire continental United States. During the brief return to atmospheric testing in 1962, a 1 1.4 megaton nuclear weapon was detonated over Johnston Island at an altitude of about 250 miles. The effects of EMP were observed in Hawaii, 800 miles east of the detonation. Streetlights and fuses failed on Oahu, and telephone service was disrupted on the island of Kauai. I think Kauai, K-A-U-A-I. I think that's how you say it. I just wanted to bring that to your attention, that that was in Hawaii. Like, okay, so listen to this. They're telling you if they dropped, if they, something EMP was done over Kansas, it would take out the entire continental United States. Then they tell you that in 1962, a 1.4 megaton nuclear weapon was detonated over Johnston Island at an altitude of 250 miles. The effects of EMP were observed in Hawaii, 800 miles east of the detonation. Street lights and fuses failed on Oahu and telephone service was disrupted on the island of Kauai. Now, the reason I bring this to you is... If that happened, I can guarantee you that probably all of Hawaii knew about it, understood what was happening, 
and probably have upgraded certain things since 1962, like maybe even in Maui, their electricity poles and things like that. I don't think those things are 100 years old like some people are saying. I just wanted to put that out there for you. I think that this is a interesting little article and I'm going to put a link to it in the pinned comment just so you can read it. But the fact that out of every place it could have mentioned, Hawaii is the one that came up talking about EMPs. And right now, you know, we're talking about the fact that there, there's videos circulating around that I cannot prove are real because you can do anything you want to on uh, the internet these days and with CGI and Photoshop and stuff. But there are videos running around out rampant on, on um, social media right now of a direct beam hitting something in the middle of Lahaina. I can't prove that it's real, but I also can't prove that it's fake. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention also. That's what I have for you guys today. There is probably a lot more we need to be going over, but this is what I've got for right now. There will be more later on. I wanted to keep it kind of short, sweet, simple. Oh, other thing I wanted to bring to the attention of some people is I think I have this pulled up. Do I have this pulled up? Hold on. Let me make sure I have this pulled up. I might not. Hold on. So this is the part I want to bring up to you. This is um, basically Hawaii legislature. This is HB 869, okay? And it says the legislature finds that coroners should be separate from law enforcement and free to make independent judgments when investigating deaths. Under current state law though, the chief of police for a county serves as the coroner if the county does not have a medical examiner. Making coroners independent from law enforcement will promote transparency, avoid conflicts of interest, and encourage more confidence in, in uh, coroner's findings, which we talked about yesterday. Now, I also wanted to mention to you that the head of Maui's emergency management agency resigned for health reasons in the immediate aftermath of the fires, and his replacement is being sought. And what that means is that right now, Again, the chief of police will be the coroner. The other issue here is that they are, let's see, death investigations in Maui County, Hawaii is managed by the police and the chief of police is the coroner. It's, it's exactly how it works, how we talked about yesterday. I have people in the comments saying it's illegal for the, the chief of police or the police chief to be the coroner in Hawaii, and it's not. I would like to kindly request that people make sure they know a couple things before running rampant in comments because unfortunately that's how things get blown out of proportion or misconstrued or wrong things spread around. It's like that telephone game. You hear something here and you just keep repeating it and that person repeats it and that person repeats it. And by the time it's, you know, taken off like crazy, it's not what it's actually supposed to be. So I just wanted to put that out there. Just make sure you fully understand. Just like some people were saying, you know, the mayor in uh, Hawaii is the same mayor of Las Vegas. Well, no, the police chief in Maui in uh, Lahaina area is the same police chief from the Las Vegas area when they had the whole concert uh, massacre there. So that is accurate. But I just want people to make sure you're really paying attention to what you are repeating and pay attention to what you are bring taking in and believing, okay? You guys know I would never steer you wrong intentionally. I try my best to get the most accurate information for you. And if I am ever wrong, I'm the first one to tell you I'm wrong. And I don't want people getting the wrong ideas about things just because they heard it somewhere and want to repeat it to somebody else. You have to be very careful with that kind of stuff, okay? Just want to put it out there. I love you all, Squirrel Tribe. I'm not trying to, like, offend anybody. I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware you can't always believe the things that you are seeing and hearing in comment sections of videos on YouTube or social media in general. So just make sure you're taking everything with a grain of salt, maybe doing your own research. If you think you see something or, you know, it could be plausible, research it. Find out for yourself before parroting it, okay? That is all. Listen, guys, I love you immensely. Thank you for being here with me. I'm going to keep looking into this, and I'll bring you as many new updates as I can possibly find, and then also some things they're probably not talking about. So we'll see you again on the next one. Bye, guys.